Thanks, Robert. Um, so the sermon I've got today, um, it's called Run Your Own Race. It's about, uh, the purpose is to talk about the race that we're all running. You know, like, so if you're saved, um, you know, you're living for God, then you're participating and running in this race. So one important thing to understand is that we're not in competition with each other. You know, so we're not competing with anyone, anyone else. We're just competing against ourselves. Um, so 1 Corinthians 9.24, I'll get you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any, other, by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. So we're running to obtain that prize. And that prize for us is incorruptible, but it says for the world, it is corruptible. You know, so the Lord has reward for every man according as his work shall be. So, and the race that we're in, it's, a, it's not a sprint. You know, we're in this for the long haul. This is not a race that should take days, weeks, months, or even years, it should be a race that takes decades. Amen. You know, so we need to pace ourselves so that we can reach the end, you know, because it's more important that we finish the race. Uh, and the only way to lose a race is actually to stop running, it's to drop out completely. So you're in 1 Corinthians 3, look at verse 11. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. So praise God that you'll be in heaven. But how disappointing would it be if you get there and there's just no rewards? You know, you realize that you, didn't, you either didn't participate in the race or you didn't finish the race. And so there's a, there's a loss of rewards there. You know, so where do we attain that, uh, to attain the incorruptible prize? We want those gold, silver, precious stones. You know, we don't want it to be burnt up like wood, hay and stubble because those things are unprofitable. And, you know, as, as Brother Jason pointed out to me the other day, you know, you can only suffer loss of reward. You know, there's no such, there's no such thing as, um, you know, well, I mean, God's got your reward set aside. So you can only suffer loss of that. If you don't go and do the works that he's set aside for you, and we'll get to that in a second, you know, then you can actually lose those rewards. And then they'll be burnt up and given to, or given to somebody else. Yeah. You know, so that's why our foundation is Christ. The only way for your work to abide is to build upon that foundation of Christ. You know, you, you've got to build on those spiritual things, not on the things of this earth. And we do that by serving our brethren. You know, we're preaching the gospel to your friends, family and strangers. You know, you go to church, um, you know, or, or to those in need. God says that when you lend to the poor, you're lending unto Christ. You know, so again, when, if you see your brother in need and you lend to him, then, you know, God says, well, you're lending unto me. You know, he's going to reward you for that. These are ways we can build upon you know, those uh, gold, silver, and precious stones. And th it just ma it makes sure as well that you're running your race well. You know, when you know you're building upon these things and your foundation is Christ, then you know your race is going well. So I'll get you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll read in verse 7. So 2 Corinthians 10, verse 7, it says, Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ's. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as it would terrify you by letters, for his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such an one think this, that such as are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of the number 
or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So I'll get you to turn to Matthew 25. But the last thing you want to do is looking at how you're running your race and comparing yourself to your brother. You know, you don't want to be comparing yourself to other brethren. You know, whether it be how they raise their children, you know, the kind of job they do, you know, uh, how much soul winning they do, how they educate their children, how the husband runs a household. You know, even the things they possess. You know, we just not to compare ourselves against ourselves because we're all given riches according to how the Lord sees fit. You know, and the Lord knows what we can handle. The Lord knows which abilities to give us. He knows how, many, how much riches to give us. Um, because riches can destroy you. You know, if, if you can't handle riches, God knows that. Yeah. And we look at Solomon, we look at the examples we have there, you know, where it was the riches and everything else that utterly destroyed him, yeah. you know, caused his downfall. So the Lord's not going to give you more than you're able. So you don't compare yourselves against somebody else who might have more or less than you. You know, and maybe someone does more soul winning than you. You know, maybe someone gives more financially than you do. You know, maybe someone shows more charity and love to you than others do. You know, but that's not the things we should judge on. You know, we should just be happy that there are brethren who are succeeding in their race. You know, and we're just trying to succeed in our own race. So, Pastor went over the uh, parable of talent, so I'm not going to do a whole, uh, whole thing on this. But he went through it last week. But we'll pick up in Matthew 25, 15. And it just says, And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise he that received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of these servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And verse 21, he said, the Lord, His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. So again, don't compare yourself with that one who got ten talents. If you, got, if you were given five talents, two talents, one talent, you know, the Lord was pleased with everybody except the one who did nothing with his talents. That's the only one he was, he was disappointed in. So whatever talents you've got, use them for the Lord. Use them for the kingdom. You know, everybody has at least one talent. You know, and that talent can even just be soul winning. You know, everyone's commanded to win souls. Everybody's commanded to preach the gospel, to warn others of the coming judgment. You know, so everybody can do that. Um, and that's not a gift that you're, you know, so much that's given. It's given to everyone. Everybody has at least that one gift. Amen of preaching the gospel. But there are other ways as well. You know, like Pastor Kevin, he, he spent a lot of time working as a manager, so that enables him to work, you know, as a pastor of a church to manage people, to get people together, to, to organise soul winning events, to organise even a church down in Sydney, you know, which is celebrating their second year anniversary today, which is great, you know. Like, I use my IT skills to be able to, to help the church out. We've got Brother Sam and Brother Caleb who bring their tools in and they can, you know, they've done up the place. You know, fixed a few things that were broken. You know, there's a lot of good, good ways you can serve the church. We've got, you know, Brother Tim and, and Caleb as well who do uh, song leading and, and Brother Sam. You know, they, that all helps us a lot. You know, and they're using their abilities to serve the church, to serve the brethren. They're running their race, but they're earning great rewards at the same time. You know, James... Uh, James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, variableness neither shadow of turning. So every gift's from God, every perfect gift is from the Father above. You know, that's not just the things we have, but they're the abilities and talents and gifts that he's given us. I'll get you to turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll just read to you from 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter 4 verse 8. It says, And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging, as every man hath received the gift. Even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 
If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So everybody here has their purpose. You know, so we all run our race at our own pace. You know, we don't look, on, look down on someone because they're not as spiritual. They might not be as charitable. They might not be as well off. You know, we don't look down on them. You know, everyone works according to his abilities. As long as they've been given a gift and everyone's been given a gift and they're using that gift in the service of the Lord, then praise God for that. You know, that man, you know, he's doing well in his race. Yeah, so we don't judge another man's race. You know, we run our own and we let the charity and the love we have for each other, you know, we let that prosper. And we'll see here in 1 Corinthians 12 that the church is made up of the body, which is many members. So you've got the eyes, the ears, the mouth, hands, feet, like every part of our body, you know, there's a member for that. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12, it says, For as the, as the body is one and hath many members... And all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. So we're all equal in the kingdom of God. You know, that's why there's no reason to compare ourselves amongst ourselves. You know, because we're the servants of God and He's actually our Master. We answer to Him. Romans 14 says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So, you know, we don't judge how another runs his race, but we also don't cause him to stumble. We don't put things in front of him, you know, that might cause him to stumble, things that might be, you know, a conscience issue or something like that, doubtful disputations. We don't bring those up and put them in our brother's way, causing him to stumble, you know, because we're in this together. If you love your brother, you're going to help him succeed in his race as well as your own. You know, so you may, ha you may have envy for your brother and the success of his race, but it's wicked to think that way. Amen. You know, it might cause you to do evil or to put a stumbling block in front of them to cause them to fall, but it's not supposed to be that way amongst us. So if you're still there in 1 Corinthians 12, in verse 14, it says, For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are there many members, yet but one body. So that just points out the necessity of every single person here. You know, everyone's here for a purpose in this building today. Because God knows the abilities he's given you and he sets you to be here to be part of that body. You might be the eye, you know, I might be the ear. We've got people who are the mouth, the preachers and, you know, the song leaders and things like that. You know, people who work with their hands. Like, we need the entire body. And God's got you here because you're part of that body and you have a purpose for this place. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's what it's about. It's about using our abilities and talents, you know, for each other because then you'll have a church that's pleasing to God. So in verse 21, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honourable, upon these we bestow more abundant honour, and our comely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honour to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, that the members should have the same care, one for another. So again, every part has its purpose. 
There is no part of the church, no person here that does not have a purpose in this church. It says no matter how feeble you are, God will actually you know, give you even, even, an even greater position because those things that are feeble are necessary. You know, so everyone has something that they can do. You know, so God has you here. As a, you know, there's got to be something you can do to serve the church, to serve your brethren. You know, it can even just be showing charity to your brother. You know, so we, we all work together. It's not, a, it's not the Kevin Sepulveda show. You know, we're not all just spectators here. You know, we all need to work together to keep this place running. You know, because even he, you know, he's one part of the body. You know, he's the, he's the head, but he's still only one part of the body. You know, it takes all of us, you know, to have a good successful church and to run this race. You know, so your race and your purpose is participating in whatever God's got you here for. You know, and you need to figure that out. You know, no one else can probably point that out for you, but you know what you're good at. You know what you're able to do. So you need to find a way, you know, to help the brethren when you can. Uh, so, you know, verse 26. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honoured, all the members rejoice in it. So again, whatever happens with this church, it's not just pastor that gets all the glory. You know, it's like we all share in that because we've all played a part in making this thing happen. Whenever a soul gets one, it's like we all took part in that. You know, it's whenever we add to the church, baptise somebody. I mean, we all get to rejoice in that. But when somebody's having a hard time, then we mourn with them as well. We suffer with them. You know, this is what it teaches us. So again, it's about what you're able to do, what you can physically do, what you can mentally do, what you're actually being given to do by the Lord. You know, and everyone can win souls. That's something for everyone. That's, there's no excuse for, for anyone not to win souls. You know, if you know the gospel, you're saved, then you can get someone else saved. You know, so that's not a gift you need to wait on. That's a gift that everyone receives as soon as they receive eternal life. But you just need to find a way to serve God, serve the church and your brethren. Um, I'll get you to turn to Romans chapter 16. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1, we're just going to go through a list, of, list here of people that worked with Paul. It says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at St. Crea, that you receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that you assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succor of many, and of myself also. So Paul here is saying, look, this woman's helped me out a lot, so when she comes to you, I want you to help her out. You know, give her whatever she needs, because she's somebody who was helping out Paul. We see also Greek Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Eponidas, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners, who were of note among the, the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Obain, our helper in Christ. And Stachus, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philogus and Julia, Nereus and his sister and Olympus, and all the saints that are with them. Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason. Sorry, I jumped down to verse 21. Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sospita, my kinsman, I salute you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Gaius, mine host, and the whole church saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you. And Quartus, a brother. So look at all these names that assisted Paul through his ministry. And this is not even a complete list. This is just from this one chapter. 
you know, there are others like uh, Tertius who wrote down the epistle of Paul. There are many others like Timothy and others who wrote down the epistles of Paul because his eyes were dim, you know, so he didn't write many letters by his own hand. But, you know, Paul would not have had the success he had if it wasn't for these brethren. You know, he would not have run the race he's run, and he's run one, probably one of the most successful races mm. in the New Testament. But he didn't do it alone. He always had his brethren there with him. There was always your Barnabas, there was always your Timothy, your Silas, you know. All these men who were with them, who helped him out, you know, who helped to run his race. And that's the way we can be as well, you know, because he had his infirmity, which was his eyes were dim. So he was able to, to have help from brethren to assist him in his weakness because they had the strength in his weakness. You know, and while the Lord is our strength in weakness, our brethren can also be our strength in weakness. You know, so we're to run the finish that race, as Paul did. We stay the course. We don't compare ourselves amongst ourselves. And your race is not my race. You know, we're not competing with each other. And the single most important point to remember is to never drop out of the race. But there's another point as well, and that's not to join up with the world's race. See, the world does have its own race, but that race is where you accumulate the most wealth and possessions. You know, having children can be a burden, and it's a life of vanity, you know. The aim of the race that the world runs is to see who can fulfill the lust upon their flesh before they die, you know. But there's no prize for that race. You know, they're running in vain. See, Paul, before he was saved, he ran a race against the people of God. You know, and he said it was in vain. You know, and don't let your race be in vain. You know, so let your works be good, fruitful works, and that you're working out your faith, you know, building on that foundation of Christ. Um, and the race we run for God, it doesn't matter where you finish. As long as you finish, there's a prize waiting for you you know, for all the works that you've done. So we're working to increase the kingdom, you know, so we're going to benefit and edify and bless the brethren of God and all of his children because there's always profit in that. So I'll get you to turn to Philippians chapter 3. But uh, we see Demas, he dropped out of God's race and he joined the world's race. In 2 Timothy 4, 9, it says, Do thy diligence and come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed under Thessalonica. So we get instructions in Philippians 3, 7 about this very thing, about how Paul dealt with this. In Philippians 3, 7, he says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I might win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his, re of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, that I may apprehend that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count my, not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So that's what we should do as well. You know, we look at Paul, he says, counting his old ways is dumb. You know, he, he's not looking back and he's forgetting those things which are behind. You know, but moving forward, you know, always moving forward, you know, to those things that are before us. Not getting into, sucked into the race that this world runs, you know, which is looking to increase in your earthly, earthly goods, but actually always moving towards that finish line in God's race, pressing towards that high calling in Christ Jesus. So I'll get you to turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts 15, 36. But we see here now, even if we have a setback, we can always get back in the race. 
So while you never want to quit the race, sometimes you need to take a break. Sometimes you need to slow down. You might be walking. You might be even looking like you're standing still. But just don't drop out of the race. But even if you do, there can still be help from the brethren. You know, so we have that example of with Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark in Acts chapter 15, verse 36. It says, And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take, to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the church. So even though they had a falling out, you know, he still took Silas. You know, Paul and Silas ran together, even though he didn't take Mark. But Barnabas took Mark. Um, because for a while Mark was not running with Paul. Paul refused to take him because on one of their previous trips, you know, John Mark actually had pulled out and said, no, I'm not going. You know, and, and Paul's just like, well, I need someone who's reliable, so I can't take you with me. But Barnabas still had a heart, you know, and he still uh, had a heart for Mark and said, look, you know, you want to come back with us? You can join my race. You know, well, I'll, I'll take you with me. We can run together and we can win some souls and we can get some, uh, you know, get some rewards together. And we see in, in 2 Timothy 4, Paul actually starts to see the value of Mark as well, who Barnabas had brought back into the race. So 2 Timothy 4.11 says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So while Barnabas helped Mark back into the race, you know, we can't make a brother run his race, but we can certainly encourage him to race with us. If we say, look, you know, this is where I'm going. Do you want to come with me? You know, like I'm going on an overseas missions trip. Hey, let's go, you know, let's go do something. Like try and get someone back into the race because they might have given up on themselves at some point for, for whatever reason. And we'll see that sometimes that can be just the sin or the burdens of this life. But, uh, you know, Barnabas showed a lot of charity. And we should always have that charity and love, you know, for each other. Because we want our brother to finish his race, you know. While we're not in competition, you know, so we're going to finish our race. We need, we need to work on that first and foremost. But if you see your brother struggling, help him finish his race, you know. Because we all just want to finish. And if we finish, then everybody wins, you know. So th it's not a prize pool where if I help you, then you're taking some of my rewards. Because God's already got the rewards set aside for everyone according to to his own works. As I said, you can only suffer loss if you don't do the works. But, you, you know, helping your brother isn't going to cause you to lose anything. In fact, it'll help you to actually gain more rewards because the Lord's going to be very pleased with that. So I'll get you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. So before I wrap up, I just want to show you, it's an interesting story from Elijah and just make a, a comparison a small comparison between him and Jonah. In mean, 1 Kings 19, verse 1, just give you a second. 1 Kings 19, verse 1, it says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. So Elijah had just slayed all the false prophets of Baal, and of course Jezebel, the witch behind it, is all mad about that. So she's basically trying to kill Elijah. It says, Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he rose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and requested for himself that he might die. And said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, there an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink 
and laid him down again. And as the angel of the Lord came upon the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because thy journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the man of God. So don't let that verse pass you by. That one meal sustained him for 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. But uh, Elijah, he's tired and he's fainting under that tree. And he was weary from running away from Jezebel. You know, and he wanted to die under that tree. But God fed him and kept him in the race. You know, now our, f- our food is the word of God. The scripture is our food. You know, we, we don't go a day without reading, reading the Bible because that is our daily bread. But, you know, the Bible says we need to be filled with both the word of God and also our daily bread, you know, that actual bread to sustain us. But it says if we seek after God and his works, then we don't need to worry about the daily bread. We don't need to worry about the physical food, that if we seek first his kingdom, that he'll give all those things to us. I'll just read to you from Matthew 6. It says, Matthew 6.30, Wherefore, if God so clothed the the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all those things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So that's a promise that, you know, God will sustain us with what we need to complete our race. You know, if we're focusing on his kingdom and, and running his race, then, you know, we, we, we get our, our daily sustenance from the word of God and the daily bread will be provided to us. You know, and even Elijah during the drought was sustained by the widow woman. You know, the Lord made sure that that food and oil never ran out. You know, during, during a, not that bad drought they went through. Um, David said in Psalms thirty-seven twenty-three, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. We all know Romans 8.28, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So we run the race that God set before us, says he'll take care of the rest. You know, we don't seek after our own riches or glory. You know, because that's the race that the world runs. And even David wrote, if, if you stumble, the Lord will uphold you with his hand. You know, what greater promise would that, is that? You know, that God will assist us in our race. He'll sustain us in our race, you know, and help us to complete it. So we don't have anything to fear. So the question to ask is, where are you headed? You know, we all know the story of Jonah, that, which we're going to contrast with, uh, with Elijah there, you know. See, Elijah was, was fleeing for his life, but he was still heading towards where the Lord wanted him, still running the Lord's race, and the Lord sustained him. But Jonah was fleeing from the Lord. You know, he was fleeing, to the, fr- fleeing the Lord and even wanted to go back to the world. But where did that take him? You know, he couldn't escape the Lord. He ended up in the, in the belly of a whale, going through what he called hell on earth, you know, to be able to actually end up preaching what's right and doing it even begrudgingly going to the city of Nineveh and preaching to them so we need to make sure that you know we have to run the right race and don't try and flee from the Lord because it's futile you know just always be moving forward you know if you if you're always moving forward then you're doing well you know you don't want to be going backwards you don't want to be standing still we should always be increasing in knowledge in wisdom and in faith. You know, so as I said before, there might be times where you need to slow down, you know, where you might, instead of running, you go to a jog or you go to a walk or, you know. But you just want to make sure you finish, that you stay the course. Um, Ecclesiastes 9.11 says, I returned 
and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favour to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time, when it falleth suddenly upon them. So, you know, it says, if you're running your race in your own strength and for your own purpose, then you might not finish at all. You know, it says, time and chance happeneth to them all. So, you know, you'll see that where people are actually running for the Lord. But then you see that, uh, you know, well, they're not running for the Lord, but you see they're actually running for another man or even for themselves. And when something happens to that man or themselves, they give up because they're actually not running to the Lord. They're not running his race, but their own. And as I said, time and circumstance, you know, all these things can alter whether you finish your race or not. And that's out of our control. That's in God's control, but it's out of ours. You know, so those obstacles and traps, you know, they can slow you down or even take you out of the race. But if you're running your race for God and seeking him first, that's not going to happen. You know, he will be with you. He'll uphold you with his hand and sustain you with his food. So we don't know when our lives will be up. We just want to make sure that we're profitable to the Lord. And maybe our lives are extended because we're profitable to him. Or maybe our lives are taken because we're not. You know, you don't want to die and see your reward, you know, and then desire to have done more. You know, you want to have an abundance when you get to heaven and say, you know what, I've earned everything that's here. You know, I did all I could. I, I worked hard and here's my reward. You know, you don't want to have regret about that. That's why it's important that we seek those heavenly rewards. Uh, Ephesians 5.15, it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So again, those days are evil. We don't know when our lives are going to be up. So just do what you can while you can, you know, and that's the purpose of it. So another thing we'll see here in Hebrews, I'll just read Hebrews 12.1. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth eas- so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So part of that is also shedding off the sin and the burdens that might slow you down. You know, so we can be slowed down by the sins we have, unconfessed sins, but we just need to confess and forsake them to the Lord. There, there may be other burdens, the burden of sin, but also say you lose a loved one or something like that. Like that can cause you also, you know, to, to drop out of the race. But it says not to let that happen, just shake off those burdens, shake off that, the sin, you know, and move forward. Because they will be a snare and a trap that causes you to quit. Even persecution can be a a burden, you know. So the the chapter I had read before the service, Jeremiah 12, Jeremiah 12, 5, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? So when persecution and tribulation comes, it's not going to get any easier to run your race. In fact, it's going to get much more difficult. So it's saying that if you can't run now with the footman, how are you going to contend with horses? Those horses are much faster than the footman. You're not going to be able to keep up. You know, so we know in the future there will be great tribulation. There will be persecution. So now's the time to be training for that. Now's the time to be earning rewards while the getting's good. You know, you prepare for the hard times by doing the work, earning the rewards, while it's easy. You know, so we should run and make ground when it's easy and earn those rewards. So I'll just recap those three points. The first point is to run your race at your own pace, according to your abilities and gifts. You know, don't concern yourself with how your brother's running, except, you know, to partake in his race. You know, if, if it's, if you're able, because we're not in competition. And so point two is to help others in their race. If you find your paths cross and you're able to run together, you're able to hold each other up, you know, then that can be a blessing for both of you. 
And point three is to aim to finish the course, to be faithful to the end, even unto death. So I'll just end on these words from Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of not my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Let's pray. Brother Michael, do you mind?